Now, the latest from ITV News Meridian with Fred Dynage and Sangeeta Barbara. Hello and welcome to Friday's ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines here in the South. The toddler left to die in a flat in Brighton. Her teenage mother, out partying for six days, is jailed for allowing a seer to starve to death. The rising cost of fuel, more than £1.50 a litre at some petrol stations. Prices hit their highest levels in eight years. Also tonight, filmed by a paddleboarder, footage emerges of a shark swimming in the waters off the Dorset coast. And it's a mud fest. Two major events this weekend, hoping for some dry weather, but will they and us get it? Good evening. A teenage mother from Sussex who left her toddler alone at home to die of neglect while she partied elsewhere for six days has been jailed for nine years for manslaughter. Verfi Coody left 20-month-old Asiya to starve at their Brighton home as she celebrated her 18th birthday more than 50 miles away. The tragedy has triggered an investigation of the child safeguarding agencies involved in the case. James Dunham reports from Lewis Crown Court. Verfi Coody celebrates her 18th birthday in London, telling friends her daughter Asiya is being looked after by family. Showing no responsibility for her 20-month-old daughter, the harrowing reality for this little girl was six days of suffering. No food, no water, no strength to even cry. We were interviewing her um, in, in the police station she never once told us the truth um, and so she was never willing to accept responsibility for anything um, she made up a web of lies for the police as she had done with her friends and her family um, to make sure that she wasn't caught and that her uh, the fact that her child was home alone was undetected on the evening of the 5th of December 2019, Coody is seen in this CCTV leaving her flat. She travels from Brighton Station to London, where she celebrates her birthday at clubs and a festival until the 9th. She is then driven more than 150 miles away from her home to the West Midlands. At a McDonald's in Coventry, Coody's bank card is used, as well as at a pizza restaurant in Solihull. Coody eventually arrives back in Brighton on the 11th of December. This footage shows her going into her flat. Three hours later, she calls 999 in a distressed state, telling the operator, help, my baby is not waking up. In sentencing, Judge Christine Lang told Coody you could be very deceitful and manipulative when you wanted things to go your way, telling her you put the needs of your own desires above those of your daughter. She went on to say that you did not tell the truth to save yourself, you abused your position as a mother and failed in your job to protect your daughter, causing unimaginable physical harm. Up until 14 years old, Coody was described as happy and caring, but as she got older, she'd go missing, the subject of several police appeals. In September 2019, Brighton and Hove City Council's social services placed her and Asia in a specialist house run by YMCA Downslink for vulnerable families. A safeguarding review is currently taking place, looking at the role of authorities during the tragedy. This was Coody before she pleaded guilty at a previous court appearance in March. Today, as her nine-year sentence was read out, six of which will be spent in jail, the 19-year-old broke down in tears. Any remorse, though, will not rectify the pain and suffering caused on the five days, 21 hours and 58 minutes, where her baby Asiya was left to die. James Dunham, ITV News. Police investigating the reported rape of a 15-year-old girl in Bournemouth have released an e-fit image of a young man they'd like to speak to. The victim said it happened in the sea off Bournemouth Beach near the Oceanarium on the 18th of July. People who were on the beach that day are being asked to check their photographs and videos for anything that could help the inquiry.
Deaf children in the South achieve an entire GCSE grade below their hearing classmates on average. Well, that's according to the National Deaf Children's Society. The organisation is calling for councils to step up and provide better support. Around 6,500 children in our region are deaf, with the majority attending mainstream schools. Well, now it's bad news if you regularly fill up at the pumps as petrol prices hit their highest level for eight years. Motoring organisations say drivers have faced relentless rises for months. More demand for oil as Covid restrictions ease is being blamed. Well, the price per litre has soared as high as £1.50 per litre in places. Mike Pearce has been getting reaction. For record numbers heading away for day trips and staycations this weekend, the news couldn't be worse. Long delays on the roads and fuel prices higher than for several years. Shocking. Yeah, you know. Can't believe it, really. <laughs> anyway. How do people cope with it, do you think? I don't know. I think, I think some people it doesn't matter. But a lot of people it does matter. It matters to their pocket, doesn't it? I haven't seen that level of prices for maybe five years, maybe seven years, something like that. How do you feel about that? And it's quite um, intrusive, and it sort of you know adds up for everything. You're travelling by car, and you you know you need to get the you know the best deal for the fuel because it all adds up. Being away, you know, it's not cheap to holiday in this country, so you do have to shop around for the best fuel. Last month saw the largest rise in the price of unleaded since January. A means on average, a litre now costs one pound thirty-five a price not seen since late September 2013. Diesel, meanwhile, now costs on average £1.37 a litre. A driver filling up a 55-litre car with petrol now pays on average £11.47 more than they did a year ago. If you come to a motorway services like this one, you'll be paying more. In fact, it's over £1.50. And of course, if you buy diesel, that's even more expensive. It doesn't seem that long ago prices dropped below a pound a litre. The reason we're told for the current hike is the production dropped during the early part of the pandemic. But now we're all travelling again, demand is high, pushing up the price of the available supplies. As we start to vaccinate and countries come out of their economic torpor, we can see the demand for oil increasing. And that has had the effect of pushing up crude oil prices, judged by crude that uh, we use, uh, from around $50 a barrel to $75 a barrel just this year. That's nearly a 50% rise. So we're at an eight-year high with pump prices, and we're seeing, even in some uh, forecourts, at £1.50 a litre. Now, this is a really expensive time. We've got people with more staycations, they're doing more days out, and they're really being hurt in the pocket when they go and fill up. And unfortunately, I think it's here to stay for a little while yet. But it's not just drivers being hit. The price of heating oil is more than double the cost of a year ago. And as people get supplies for the winter, this family-run delivery firm say a shock for consumers is in store. Yeah, I can't see the price coming down too much the way it is at the moment, so it just means that it's going to cost people more money to get their fuel. I suppose there's nothing you can do to, to, to try and prevent that? No, we give as good a margins as we can. We, we try and keep it as low as possible for people, but obviously we've got to make our bit and, uh, it, you know, the price is the price. We, we can't control that. And so for now it seems the only way the price of all types of fuel is going and that's up. Mike Pierce, ITV News, North Hampshire. And plenty of comments about this on our Facebook page. Let's start with Julian Bailey. Bailey. Julian says, so can the petrol companies explain the massive price drop during the first couple of lockdowns? Didn't it drop to just under £1 a litre, he asks. Well, meanwhile, Sam Stevens is concerned about the possible impact on shopping prices, saying this will put everything up in the shops as it all comes by lorry. Paul Hurst from Shanklin says petrol is cheap. It gets dug up, put in a refinery, made into petrol, then shipped back to England. For what? £1.30 a litre, he says. That's cheap. Cheap? I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure. <laughs> Suzanne Farrell says, I work as a supply teacher and it makes me think twice about jobs to take because of the cost of petrol. As always, thank you for all of your views. 
More news now from around our region. A campaign has been launched to conserve canals in the region by making them cleaner and greener. Ecologists say urgent action is needed to preserve nature and wildlife on our waterside. The Canal and River Trust is running a nationwide appeal called Act Now for Canals. The organisation says that during the pandemic, canals have been uniquely placed to be the much-needed back garden for millions of people. The RSPCA is appealing for help to find a new home for a young dog who has never been outside. It's thought the one-year-old Springer Spaniel Cross, named Lancelot, has never left the house before, being taken in by the charity in June. He's being cared for at the Mount Noddy Animal Centre in Chichester. Meanwhile, a white stork, which had to have part of a wing amputated, has been released into a six-acre nature reserve in Sussex. Volunteers were called to Mayfield in East Sussex in June after reports of an injured bird. After complex surgery and several weeks of care and attention, thankfully the stork is said to have been fully recovered. Good news. And you are watching ITV News here in the Meridian region. Remember, you can find more on today's top stories by going to our website, itv.com forward slash Meridian. You can call us. Remember, you can also follow us. That's on Facebook and on Twitter. Footage has emerged of a pair of sharks swimming close to the Dorset coast. Yes, it follows the closure of the beach at Boscombe on Wednesday after a sighting of what was described as a large aquatic creature. Paddleboarder Anthony Robbins filmed the sharks near the surface just off Hengetsbury Head a few weeks ago. They're right under my board. Anthony has some knowledge of sharks and thinks they were probably taupe or smooth hounds, both are harmless to humans. And that morning the water was really, really glassy, so it meant you could see everything like rippling across the water. And we just saw a couple of fins, um, like a, maybe 50 yards ahead of us, uh, moving quite slowly. And it was just because it was so glassy, you could see them cutting across. It was quite exhilarating um, to see nature. And seeing them move in that, that shark-like way was, was fantastic as I went right under the board. So it was nice. Smooth hands, eh? Talking of smoothies, time to meet Andrew Pate with the sport. Andrew, great news for you and me and thousands of others. It's back. It certainly is, Fred. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Our weekends enriched or ruined because football is back and so are the fans. After 18 months, our clubs can finally welcome back capacity crowds. It's going to be emotional. For Reading, this season marks the club's 150th anniversary and a huge new mural shows just how important the fans are. Here's Mel Bloor. Taking pride of place at the select car leasing stadium, the fan mural measures an impressive six by six metres each face representing the passion and pride felt by fans throughout the club's rich and revered history. The artwork was painstakingly hand-painted by Scotland-based artist Chris Rutterford and took nine months to complete. They're all bespoke painted portraits and every individual deserves my time to make it perfect and given the year we've had there's a lot of tragic stories and you know this has become a real testimonial mural for a lot of people. We also have people that are there who've been at their first match you know it's a real party and that's the vibe that we were going for. The mural is intended to be split over two locations this the first section featuring former Royals manager Brian McDermott. The second, featuring Steve Koppel, who guided Reading to their first ever stint in the Premier League, is due to be finished by the end of the season. This year marks Reading Football Club's 150th anniversary. The mural was commissioned to celebrate this momentous milestone and demonstrate the important part played by the fans across the years. Yeah, um, it's obviously a big season for us this year, 150th, um, and we want to get a way of getting the fans included in that. And uh, one of the ideas which was suggested was th this mural, and uh, yeah, it looks really good. Among those to feature on the mural are brothers James and Andrew Hunt. 
sadly we lost my grandfather to Covid last year and we thought it would be very fitting to have him immortalised in Reading FC's history on the mural. We know that whenever we come to this stadium he's going to be here watching the game with us and it's just uh, such an amazing feeling. The Royals kick off their championship campaign against Stoke City tomorrow. This mural, a striking reminder that the fans will again be every bit as important to the club as results. Mel Bloor, ITV News, Reading. And the first of our fans back are Bournemouth supporters because the Cherries kick things off tonight against recently relegated West Brom. Our other sides are all on the road, including Oxford United, who are looking to make it third time lucky. The U's have lost in the League One playoffs the last two seasons, but their manager is hoping their fans can cheer them on to promotion. I just feel that having them back in, the support that they'll bring to us, the noise level they'll, they'll, they'll sort of inject into the stadium. And that wall of yellow noise is, is back together again and I'm sure there'll be a few people with a lump in the throat sort of thinking, wow, this is... I've missed it, uh, but not half as much as us either and we're, we're, we're so looking forward to the challenge. Now the Tokyo Olympics ends on Sunday. And it's been another medal-winning day for athletes from the South. The women's hockey team, who train at Bisham Abbey in Berkshire, won bronze after beating India 4-3. It's the third games in a row in which they've won a medal. Meanwhile, sailors from the South have been telling us about their gold rush at the Olympics and seeing their families enjoy the wins back home. The Ailey McIntyre from Hailing Island is meant following in the footsteps of her dad Mike, who won gold at the Seoul Olympics in 1988. I think what I really got from my dad was this sense of you can do anything if you work hard enough, if you push hard enough you can do it. And you know, he always says if I can do it so can you and I think it, that's so true, you know, I pushed so hard for this, I've worked my socks off and, and to be here and, I mean, wow, what a moment, both of us with gold medals, it's just amazing. Superb. Now, it's being claimed staying active is key to many children improving their mental health after a year of Covid lockdowns. A new survey suggests sport was the most important factor in improving their well-being and with society opening up again, it's all about making sure the opportunities are out there. Here's Nick Smith. Having a kickabout with friends used to be one of life's simple pleasures. But in the last year, we've realised it's something that can be taken for granted. For Alice Birch and her children, Ray and Lois from Ashurst in Hampshire, the power of sport to bring people together, whether participating or watching things like the Olympics, helps them forge stronger bonds with each other. So we love watching the sport as a family, it's really nice family time, sitting down, watching all of the, the athletes. And also I think it's a great inspiration for young people and seeing all of the different events is just really, really good fun. Football training camps like this one are taking place all across the region over the summer holidays. For the kids taking part, they're making up for lost time. After spending months unable to share in physical activity with their friends due to COVID restrictions, a survey of more than 2,000 schools reported more than half of pupils had seen a noticeable decline in their health and well-being. So it's a big relief to be able to participate in something like this again. When you were locked down, how did that make you feel when you couldn't go out and play proper games and go to proper training? Sad because like, you couldn't see your friends and it made me feel very bored because all you could do was play football on your computer. Tell me what the best thing is about getting out and playing again. I think it's just the thrill of playing football and just going around and having fun with your mates. Since the end of lockdown and we've come back playing football, um, we've definitely seen confidence growing within children, which is amazing to see, where there's different peer groups coming together. Um, it allows them to make new friends, which is massively important too. And it's claimed organised sport can play an even more crucial role for the well-being of those from ethnic minority groups. A survey commissioned by one of the UK's leading professional basketball teams suggested over a third of young people from non-white backgrounds felt most connected to their local communities when playing sport. We all know sport inspires and we ask you know, professional athletes like this to go out and inspire young people. Well, if it can have that much of a positive impact, the lack of it can have 
that much of a negative impact. So with sport, it's the ability to achieve, the ability to be successful, the ability to go out and actually be yourself. I'm not surprised by that number being so high because anywhere that we can achieve is really important to us. Months of restrictions have certainly taken their toll on the youngest in our society. But there are many firm believers that sport has the power to bring them together and help them move forward once again. Nick Smith, ITV News. Oh, yes, here is to an energetic summer. So, Andrew, what will you be doing this summer that's energetic? Oh, good question, Fred. No, I, in actual fact, Freddie, it's not going to be Olympic style, um, but I'm going to be doing a bit of kayaking this weekend down the uh, Dorset coast. So um, I'll be very energetic. I might, be, might not be able to move on Monday, but <laughs> that'll be my attempt. Stay dry, Andrew. Thanks very much Thank indeed. You. That's lovely. <laughs> Now thousands are attending a major religious convention in Hampshire, although it has been scaled back because of the pandemic. Yes, the three-day festival near Alton is being held by the UK's Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the youngest denomination within Islam, and strict Covid protocols, of course, in place. Its purpose is to strengthen the bond between followers, as Derek Johnson now explains. It's wet and muddy underfoot. But organisers are just glad this event can go ahead after it was cancelled last year. Normally 40,000 are expected for the three-day annual convention for the UK's Ahmadiyya Muslim community at the site it owns near Alton. This time there'll be just 4,000. So the feel of the scale of the event will be very different. But, you know, this is a very significant event for us. So the people coming here, the emotion and uh, the value of this to them, they will take it very sort of uh, in a very personal way. It's extremely spiritual. So they're motivated to travel despite the difficulties, despite the rain and the mud you can see here. So that's the best thing of all that we're able to hold this is a miracle in itself. I mean, we only made the decision finally to hold this in May. So you can imagine the sort of logistics that you normally you'd plan for this back in November, December. We normally have our plans in place. It was a, a quite a challenge to get everything in place. Attendance has been restricted to 18 to 65 year olds who've been double vaccinated and there are strict entry procedures. They'll have lateral flow done on entrance and anyone with temperature or any symptoms will go back. So all communities working together to make this thing as safe as possible and uh, we are here to help provide help to anyone who's unwell and look after them. I'm quite happy that they have all the COVID protocols, especially with what's been going on and the recent sort of spike in cases and hospitalizations showing young people, unvaccinated people coming in, coming to a festival where everyone's vaccinated, tested, I feel quite safe. It will indeed be an emotional experience for those catching up with friends after a long time. The community's motto, love for all, hatred for none. Derek Johnson, ITV News, near Alton. Well, plenty of mud in Alton there and also over at the Wickham Festival in Hampshire. Yesterday's opening day saw the festival lashed by heavy rain, which turned the site into a quagmire. Didn't it just? Cars had to be towed to safety after getting stuck in the mud and the main stage had to be closed, forcing the organisers to rearrange plans at the last minute. And Mary Stanley's at the festival campsite for us now. Mary, more rain is on the way, but who cares, hey? <laughs> Yes, I think most people are just pleased to be here after nearly two years without live music and events like this. This is one of the first festivals in the region since Covid and yes, we've had the wind, the rain and that mud, but at the end of the day, the festival isn't a festival without your wellies. Early this morning, tonnes of straw was put down to soak up the mud at the Wickham Festival. Festival goers determined to have a good time despite the soggy conditions. Blitz spirit is, is probably the way to describe it, you know. This, this is the, the joy of British weather. It was a really good um, atmosphere. You just bounced a bit on the mud, didn't stand still for too long, just in case you slipped in. Yeah. Really amazing atmosphere. It's really good to see everyone out about with their kids and the whole family. It's really nice. Yeah, I think it's good everyone's still in good spirits and hopefully everyone's got their waterproofs. <laughs> but some gave up and went home yesterday as torrential rain battered the site. Dozens of cars got stuck in the mud, some drivers waiting up to four hours for their vehicles to be towed out by a tractor. First time at this festival, been looking forward to it for a long time and sadly we've arrived in the middle of a 
a rainy day and we're stuck in the mud. I think we'll uh, see if we can be towed out now rather than wait till after this evening when everybody's trying to leave and, and all being tried to towed out at once. It'll probably be chaos. We've booked the tractor man. He should be here in 20 minutes. He said he's got 15 cars already to pull out. Rain forced the closure of the main stage. Water getting into the electrics, making it unsafe. The axe moved into other tented venues around the site. Cancellation has never been an option to us. And when you see it come right and you hear all the cheering and see the smiling faces and people accepting that uh, you know, the weather, the weather is the weather. Um, we've done our best to get it on and I'm so pleased we're still going. After 18 months of uncertainty with COVID, organisers were determined the event would go ahead, whatever the weather. And the festival continues until Sunday night. Headline acts include Van Morrison and Deacon Blue. And local performers will also be taken to the stage. For some of them, it's the first time they've performed since March last year. Now, sadly, half of all festivals have already been postponed until 2022. The government's announcement of help today coming too late to save them. And those festivals that are going ahead, which include the Isle of Wight and Reading, will be hoping for some sunshine like we have tonight and not a repeat of what we saw last night with that rain and that mud. Mary, go and rescue your car. I hope it's not stuck in the mud. Many, many thanks. Seems like that rain just won't go away, will it, Fred? No. So, Pip, is it summer? <laughs> it is summer, although you'd be hard pushed to believe it. Yes, the start of August, currently very disappointing. I think yesterday felt more like October with leaden skies and outbreaks of rain pushing eastwards. And I even overheard a lady yesterday saying to her friend that she was fed up of getting soaked. I think that just about sums things up for all of us. The air above us has been very turbulent, as evidenced by some of your pictures. Let's take a look at the first one this evening. This comes from John and Jean. Now, they were taking a stroll around Medmarine Nature Reserve when they spotted the classic lumpy appearance of Mamma Martyrs at the base of this cumulus cloud, a sure sign of some heavy and potentially thundery downpours. Speaking of which, Ray Whitfield braved the downpours in Eastleigh to take this shot of the rain pounding the pavements. And Nigel Pace was walking his dog Rue on the Isle of Wight when he spotted this funnel cloud just south of St Catherine's Point. But how unusual is all of this? Well, August is actually traditionally the wettest month of the summer. Of course, at this time of year, we've got a bit more warmth around, believe it or not. That enables the air to hold more water it's got more energy and so the potential for this very unsettled weather. Come on, Pip. Need some better weather. Come on. <laughs> Do you know, I'm going to try. I think there are signs that towards the end of August and into early September, we could see something drier, maybe even the return of some hot spells. But in the meantime, here's the weekend weather forecast. <laughs> Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Meridian Weather. Looking very unsettled then over the next few days. For this weekend, plenty more showers on the cards, the ongoing risk of some heavy and potentially thundery downpours. But there will be some sunshine in between and where you manage to see that sunshine, actually not feeling too bad. But of course, low pressure remaining very much in charge. It's been with us today. It remains slow moving through the course of the weekend and Monday as well. But on Tuesday, signs of a respite, a little ridge of high pressure building in, perhaps settling things down, albeit for a brief while. Out there there at the moment there's still a fair few showers on the scene they'll fade for a time during the course of the night before further showers start to tuck in from the southwest moved in fairly quickly on that breeze and of course that breeze keeping the temperatures up once again lows for many around 13 or 14 celsius so sunny spells and showers from the word go tomorrow really those showers perhaps merging to give some longer spells of rain at times tomorrow and i think on the whole perhaps a bit more cloud around and so that will keep the temperatures down a little lower than today highs for many of us just 18 or 19 Celsius and of course fresher still in the breeze. These are the high tide times for tomorrow then for Paul just the one there 8.45 in the evening and then as we look ahead through the rest of Saturday and into Sunday well low pressure still very much a feature across the UK. Showers never too far away you can see by Sunday morning further showers starting to push in from the west there. More of the same on Monday but hopeful of something in the way of a respite come Tuesday. Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV Meridian Weather. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. 
Well, grass pollen season has now drawn to a close, but weed pollen is still causing a few problems. Levels generally low as we head through tomorrow, but in any brief drier spells, they could rise to moderate. And in just a moment, the ITV Evening News Hour continues here with Lucrezia Millerini. Sarah Gomm's got our late news for you tonight at 10.55. And don't forget, we've got bulletins right throughout the weekend here on ITV Meridian. Thank you so much for watching us this evening. Do enjoy your weekend. Stay safe if you can. And we'll see you again on Monday. Until then, from all of us here, bye-bye. Happy Thank weekend. Bye-bye.